start with a small anecdote. So in the summer of 2014, in the course of conducting research <coughs> about the relationship between English and Hindi in the Bombay film world, I interviewed the head of a dubbing studio about the process of dubbing English language content, such as American television shows and Hollywood films into Hindi. After our interview, Mina, not her real name, gave me a tour of the studios and in passing mentioned that they not only dubbed American content into Hindi, but also periodically dubbed Chinese films into Hindi. So intrigued, I asked, wow, so you have some writers on staff that know Mandarin? And she said, no. So I was even more intrigued. So you find someone in the city who knows Mandarin? No, sometimes we just, but yeah, she says, no, so sometimes we just uh, get a synopsis and of the film and work from that. But if we don't, we just fall, watch the film many, many times, try to figure out what they're saying. <laughs>
member of my committee who was a media scholar kind of good-naturedly proclaimed, well, that was fun to read, how everyone's related, but what does that tell us about production? I mean, why haven't you discussed the different roles on a film set? Uh, for example, what does an executive producer do? So aside from being disappointed, as it appeared that this committee member had completely missed the whole point of the chapter, I was also perplexed by his question. Because at that point in time, I really didn't know what an executive producer was because I had never met any in Walgreens. In other words, I had not encountered anyone with that job title during my initial field work about the production culture of the Indian film industry. Now, of course, there are executive producers, but then, then when I first did research, there, I really didn't meet anyone with that title. So over two decades of research, I've encountered assumptions and questions generated by the conventions, norms, and practices that are particular to Hollywood, but are assumed to be applicable to the structure and workings of the Indian film industry. So although both Hollywood and quote Bollywood, and I always use that in quotes, and I don't use it kind of uncritically, are commercially driven film industries, they're not organized similarly, nor do they operate in the same way. And while it's become kind of a truism that audiences and the practices of media consumption are diverse, scholars and I think lay people alike frequently assume that the process of processes of media production, somehow maybe because you know these are technologies, right? Film and television are technologies, are somehow the same. The production somehow is the same all over the world. And much of the scholarship and hence the knowledge about media industries and media productions is mainly based on the study of like North American and Western European media institutions and kind of corporate type of capitalism. However, what I learned very quickly is that the commercial nature of a media industry doesn't necessarily make its structure, organization, or working style transparent or universal. And the most striking feature of the Hindi film industry has been its exceedingly entrepreneurial and decentralized nature, by right? consisting of hundreds of independent producers, distributors, exhibitors, and financiers, comprised primarily of family businesses. The Hindi film industry has never been vertically or horizontally integrated in the manner of the major Hollywood studios or multinational entertainment conglomerates. Even now, I don't can see there's these moments of convergence, but you still don't have the kind of consolidation that you say you have in Hollywood. Now, while a studio system with contracted actors, writers, directors, etc., did exist in the 1920s and 1930s, it was superseded and replaced by the rise of independent producers and freelance talent in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And film historians attribute the influx of war to, like World War II wartime profits as the single most important factor in the rapid decline of studios and the rise of the independent producer as the characteristic feature of the filmmaking. So what's referred to as the studio era was actually a very important <coughs> chapter in the history of Indian cinema. And for much of its history, the Hindi film industry has been characterized by porous boundaries and very few barriers to entry. Essentially, the quote, industry has been and continues to be a really diffuse site where anyone with large sums of money and the right contacts is able to make a film, regardless of their experience or knowledge about filmmaking. And I can't tell you the number of times that members of the film industry predicted that I would abandon my research and remain in Bombay to make films. So from their perspective, I had gained a vast repertoire of contacts and some baseline knowledge about filmmaking. And just a quick point about that, right, is that making, like there's a real difference between making a film versus getting it distributed um, or releasing in some fashion, right? Those are two very different things. So while it's relatively easy to make a film in India, right, I mean, everyone is always hearing about India as the largest film producing country in the world, you know, I, think, I mean, it's whatever, 1,000, 1,200 here, it's like that, that number changes, but getting into the theaters or even into distribution is much harder. Only about 60% of films that are produced go go undistributed, right? So the majority of films that get made don't actually see the light of day to audiences. But the lack of barriers of entry is also connected to the scarcity of capital within the film industry. So for decades, one of the main challenges faced by new filmmakers was the high cost of capital to finance production, which was connected to the general kind of antipathy directed toward filmmaking on the part of the state. So unlike the US government, which from the very early part of the 20th century treated filmmaking as a business and helped Hollywood to distribute its films globally, the Indian state didn't accord filmmaking much economic significance, even though shortly after independence, India became the second largest film producing country in the world. And despite filmmaking being the second largest film industry in India in terms of capital investment, and the fifth largest in, the, in terms of the number of people employed, and I'm talking this is like right after independence, the kind of economic ideology of the new independent, newly independent nation state constructed this hierarchy of needs, right? So filmmaking wasn't considered an essential or important sphere of economic activity. So for the first five decades, right, of post-independent India, economic policies treated cinema as a source of tax revenue rather than as an engine of growth. So the taxes levied on cinema were akin to those levied on vices, such as gambling or like horse racing. 
the state's own classification scheme, filmmaking was regarded as an unproductive enterprise. So of course those, and all of that obviously changes like really kind of from the early 2000s. So while the Hindi film industry is a commercially driven, blockbuster oriented industry, with structures of financing and distribution, sites of power, organization of labor, and overall workforce <coughs> have been quite distinct from media industries located in the US. In contrast to Hollywood, the Indian film industry is highly decentralized, has been financed primarily by entrepreneurial capital, organized among social and kin networks, and until the early 2000s was governed by oral rather than written contracts. I mean, I would hear filmmakers say, like, why do we want something written down? The only thing that we can actually trust is Zabam, right? Like, the word, we can trust people's word. If you, give a, if you have a contract, you can change it. It's a very different attitude about, like, the relationship between text and, um, you know, the words, like, verbal. Um, the example of the Hindi film industry pretty much challenges kind of accepted or received understandings about strong formal institutions, organized capital, and or state subsidy or support as the necessary kind of preconditions or foundation for a media industry to circulate globally and be economically viable. Right? The case of the Hindi film industry really illustrates how entrepreneurial capital and a decentralized network of production, distribution, and exhibition are still capable of producing media forms that are as globally circulating, ubiquitous, and commercially successful as those produced by integrated media conglomerates funded by industrial corporate capital. Right? And through Hindi films, you can see how dominant media, big budget, large scale feature films can be produced under conditions that really don't exhibit the characteristics of some kind of organized, bureaucratic, rational mode of production. Right? I mean, so Everything that people have said, like, you know, when we talk about media industries and, like, culture industries, there's this assumption that somehow everything is very, like, standardized, automated, whatever, like, factories. We all see factories as the metaphor, but, like, it's never been like a factory. And yet, here we are, I mean, it's over this course of, you know, decades, I mean, it has been a successful industry in terms of, like, its reach, in terms of its ability to constantly reproduce itself, right? So if you look at it on paper, you would say, like, this would never be possible, right? So this is one of um, so anyway, so in that sense, the example of the Hindi film industry helps to expand our understanding of what an industry is, right? And not pursue certain organizational structures, <coughs> division of labor, or financial arrangements from the outset. In fact, a productive avenue of inquiry is to examine what structures, representations, and practices help to constitute a media industry as an industry. So for example, right, the Indian government granted industry status to filmmaking only in 1998. So one of the questions I've explored in my research is the value and impact of that state recognition, right? So it's so funny for the longest time we call it an industry, but actually the government never recognized it as such until 1998. Now in terms of my current research, um, Thank you. 
professionals also go to great lengths to make the Hollywood film scene as familiar as possible through the use of local idioms and cultural references, sometimes radically departing from the original script. So when you take the dubbing industry into account, the boundaries between the Indian film industry and Hollywood appear blurred and porous. In fact, the phenomena of dubbed films call into question the national categories, right, of like industry and cinema. Um, and while dubbed films are often ridiculed by members of the mainstream Indian film industry for being substandard or laughable translations of the English originals, observing the dubbing process re reveals that dubbed films aren't simply mere translations of the Hollywood originals. Um, so I just want to show a couple of uh, clips. I, I don't work for Fox, but it just happens to be that it's, it's kind of funny in terms of the timing, right? Because Deadpool 2 is coming out on Friday. Uh, I just wanted to show you actually a couple of clips from the first Deadpool, just to give you a sense um, of what I mean by like how things get modified. So I'm just going to show. I'm going to show you first the English clip, and then I'll show you what happens, what the clip is in Hindi. So just two short clips from Deadpool. Has anyone seen Deadpool? Can I have. So this is the English Deadpool.
Dubbing directors express concern about the state of Hindi and articulate a sense of duty toward the language and by extension its speakers. So through their articulation and deployment of vocal, linguistic, and cultural expertise, dubbing professionals are key cultural producers in contemporary India's media landscape. Thus, the production of dubbed films, from my point of view, is a rich uh, site to examine kind of questions of socioeconomic change, uh, ideas of legitimate language, and like kind of social imaginaries of difference, and ideas of belonging in contemporary India. And that's just so that's just a little bit about my current research. I'm still in the research process, so I can't say much more than that at this point. Um, moving to the second point, um, in terms of complicating discussions of market-driven media production. Sorry, so in addition to exploring what constitutes a media industry, I've really been obsessed and pursued the question of what it means to be a commercial filmmaker, and by which I mean a cultural producer for whom audience approval, as indexed by box office returns, is central. Is the mic, is it too loud? I feel, can you, no, it's okay, all right. So I'm interested in complicating the discussion of market-driven media production and demonstrating how the pursuit of profit through the circulation of images and narratives is always imbued with social and cultural meaning. To me, simple explanations of the bottom line are inadequate, for I don't think that the pursuit of profit is enough. To say that something people are doing something because they want to profit or make money, to me, that's not analysis. It's like, okay, fine. I mean, saying something is being done for profit is basically at best a descriptive statement, and most of the time, I feel, is an evaluative one. It's like you're judging. When you, when you say, like, ah, oh, they're doing it for money, it's already there's a judgment right in there. And I feel like that's not so interesting. So for me, the pursuit of profit through the circulation of images and narratives in the guise of entertaining is an immensely complex act of social and cultural theorizing on the part of filmmakers. Making films for millions or even billions of people involves like the deployment of ideas and understandings about pleasure, desire, morality, subjectivity, social identity, right? It's actually really complicated. To try to figure out what it is that makes people entertain, what gives pleasure to people, is actually really hard, right? And it's, most of the time they don't get it right, so it's actually really difficult. And also the fundamental inability to directly observe and know one's audiences that kind of marks large-scale media production invests it with high levels of uncertainty, anxiety, and insecurity. So for this reason, I found it really important to incorporate questions of subjectivity and social relations into the analysis of mainstream media production. So what do I mean by subjectivity, which is this long word we love to use in anthropology? So basically, subjectivity refers to the kind of perceptions, thoughts, sentiments, desires, and emotions that drive human action and make us complicated, contradictory beings. So studies of large-scale, commercially-oriented media industries have usually neglected issues of subjectivity and social relations among people who make media, right? It's, uh, they're just kind of seen as like, there are these businessmen, they want to make a lot of money, that's all we need to know about them, right? It, like, it's the factory. And often when we want to understand kind of con like the idea that people are complicated, they have complicated relationships to things that they make or things that they consume, it's usually when we're looking at what is often seen as like minority, oppositional, indie, what have, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, media practitioners. So, so basically the, not the mainstream. But in order, I mean, I've always felt, in order to understand the complexities of media production, it's necessary to examine even mainstream producers' sentiments and subjectivities in conjunction with questions of political economy. So while I went, well, I went, I came to Bombay to conduct fieldwork about the production process of Hindi films, what I observed in addition to the production of films were the production of filmmakers, both real and imagined. So I realized during my research that Hindi filmmakers were extremely concerned with issues of prestige, status, and cultural legitimacy. And these concerns manifested most strongly in their highly disdainful attitudes and condescending attitudes toward the majority of their audiences in India. So much so that once certain structural changes around distribution and exhibition came into place, right around the early 2000s, the driving commercial logic of the Hindi film industry for the first decade of the millennium was really characterized by an inverse relationship between the numbers of viewers, the number of viewers, and the amount of revenue. In other words, rather than trying to expand their market, filmmakers were trying to make more money from fewer people. And that's really, you see that happening with the rise of multiplexes and also where only certain markets were actually seen as important and the rest of India could like go to hell. Um, another attitude that I didn't expect or anticipate was the intense and 
ambivalence that Hindi filmmakers expressed toward what is often regarded as the quintessential feature of their filmmaking practice, the, you know, songs, the song and dance sequences, right, that are kind of the marker of Indian cinema's distinctiveness in the global media landscape. So over the course of my research, I, did, I observed that rather than being kind of a taken for granted or unquestioned feature of Hindi cinema, the production of lip sync song sequences were a site of tension, debate, and intense negotiation among workers in the Hindi film industry. Now, many scholars attribute the broad appeal of Hindi cinema to these song sequences, which they argue enable the global circulation of Hindi films to a vast array of non-South Asian audiences in locations as diverse as Greece, Indonesia, the former Soviet Union, Nigeria, and China. Paradoxically, Hindi filmmakers often regard songs as the main obstacle to global circulation. So in an attempt to make their films more appealing internationally, many have removed the songs from their films when screening them at international film festivals or distributing them in non-traditional markets. So much so one real ironic instance was many, many years ago where I was at a symposium in New York about Indian and Egyptian musical films, and the film that was being screened as, a, as an example from India was Satya, the Ram Gopal Rama film. And, and the person who programmed me said, like, you know, wouldn't it be interesting, showing a gangster film where it has songs, but the, fe they, but the producer sent the festival cut, so there were no songs in it. So here, was, it, was going, here it was being showcased in a conference about musicals, and the Indian film had no songs. So I was like, ah, oh, that's, so that such kind of shows that kind of, that kind of attitude toward it. And in my interactions with filmmakers, I discovered that they regarded lip sync song sequence as the ultimate index of popular Indian cinema's cultural kind of unintelligibility and difference from other film traditions. The reason for Indian cinema's inability to, quote, cross over to Euro-American audiences. Although the histories of the global circulation of Hindi cinema and a variety of national sites challenge and counter filmmakers' assertions about the song sequences being really alienating, Filmmakers' perceptions of their market shape their practice much more directly than such histories of circulation. I was the one always saying, you know, these films are doing really well in all kinds of places. And they're like, really? I, you know, it's like, like your films are really popular in northern Nigeria. And filmmakers would look at me like, oh, we have no idea, right? Um, an examination of Hindi filmmakers' attitudes and practices regarding these lip sync song sequences reveals how the production of commercially driven, box office oriented cinema is not only concerned with profit, but is also critically shaped by concerns about prestige, symbolic capital, and global distinction. Now, spending time observing the daily life at the sites of film production provided me with an important contextual frame with which to understand filmmakers' self-representations and discussions about their practice. So paying attention to what people do in addition to what they say kind of really illuminates both norms and expectations of what constitutes appropriate or acceptable practice. So for example, throughout my field work, I consistently observed Hindi filmmakers lamenting the quality of filmmaking bemoaning the lack of discipline and professionalism among their peers and presenting themselves in the forefront of trying to organize and professionalize the industry. No matter who they were, everyone was not that filmmaker who was like unprofessional and like couldn't do things. Everyone presented themselves as like, you know, and also even in content, that a hard game, right? You know, my film is bold, my, full, my film is different, doesn't matter. You know, everyone always presented that, themselves that way. So rather than dismissing such attitudes as being trivial or superfluous, I actually chose to examine what sort of work these attitudes were doing, as because these attitudes constituted such a significant part of the everyday life of film production in Bombay. So I decided to kind of call these um, condescending representations, like the filmmakers' own condescending representations of their own industry's working style, along with their kind of own individual assertions of being exceptional, I kind of labeled this the sentiments of disdain and practices of distinction, which I feel like played a really central role in the production culture of the Hindi film industry. So in terms of disdain, it really refers to that tremendous amount of criticism and contempt expressed by Hindi filmmakers about the working style of the industry, and then distinction really refers to filmmakers' efforts to assert their difference from this generic norm, ranging from um, trying to like talk about how they behave differently and how they're more professional, uh, to also like valorizing like the technologies that they may be using. Now, to me, these sentiments and practices operate as, as a form of boundary work, by which I mean the industry's kind of own ideological efforts to like define 
legitimate membership and practice. Like who okay, who gets to belong? Who's seen as a legitimate filmmaker? And what's what is seen as kind of a legitimate way of like doing things? So the disdain deployed by Hindi filmmakers distinguishes between legitimate filmmakers and their others. Quote those real filmmakers or so the real filmmaker versus the proposal maker or the fly-by-night operator, right? So this distinction has been ubiquitous throughout, if you read about Hindi cinema, like over the years, there's always people saying like, oh, those proposal makers, those fly-by-night operators, and it keeps coming up over and over again. So this disdain would combine with representation of one's own filmmaking practice as distinctive, like, you know, I was constantly meeting people saying like, I'm the first male filmmaker to use like some XYZ technology, right? Like whether it's like Dolby Sound or CGI or what have you. Um, so you can think of like, you know, examples like, you know, any, we see any kind of film like, you know, the, the film Robot, I mean, of course I was a Tamil film, but like you know, that kind of thing, like we are the first ones to use this. Or sometimes the first filmmaker to shoot XYZ, like, oh, well, you know, the song on, in, on top of a glacier in Alaska, or the first filmmaker to shoot in Iceland, the first filmmaker to shoot on a moving train, you know, those kinds of things, right? So all of this asserts, functions to assert exceptionalism within the filmmaking community. So in addition to, so therefore in addition to delineating the criteria of legitimate membership and professional standards, I found that Hindi filmmakers' practice as a boundary work really attempted to create what I call an alternate regime of value and criteria of prestige that are independent of commercial outcome. Most films flop, right? So you can't just rely in the commercial, in the mainstream or commercial film industry on box office outcome to demarcate who is legitimate and significant, right? So in this manner, boundary work is crucially tied to the constitution of like filmmakers themselves, you know, their kind of subject subjectivity. Because it provides a means to counter both directly and indirectly what's what I refer to as the profit-driven frameworks of value and status operating within the film industry. Think of filmmakers like Imtiaz Ali or Anurag Kashyap or Vishal Bharadwaj. They don't have they don't necessarily have tremendous commercial success. I mean, I'm just using these because these are recent examples, but they're all still considered A-list filmmakers or really important filmmakers. They still keep getting to make their next film. They still keep getting the big stars to be in their films, right? But if you look at, if you just looked at their box office, they haven't done well, right? So this is what I mean. This is an example of that. So examining the boundary work practices of Hindi or actually depending on your interest, any filmmaker, like mainstream filmmaker, not only yields insights into the structure and functioning of the Hindi film industry, but also sheds light on the nature of market-oriented mass media production more generally. So producers' boundary work practices demonstrate that commercial media production is fraught with contestations around value. Right? So while profits at the box office are regard regarded right, as the main source of value for a commercial film, they also generate what I call a potential crisis of value. Right, because in the industry, a hit film is often conflated with a good film, but can we always assume that good films will become hits and bad films become flops? No, right? We don't, I mean, we, that's, that would be a really, you know, like a wrong assumption, but that's what I mean, like, in terms of these different, uh, different notions of value. So while appealing to large-scale audiences generates economic value in terms of profits, it often diminishes the aesthetic and cultural value of such media forms from the perspective of, the structures and institutions and actors who kind of have the power to what I mean we call consecrate or assign value to these forms. The so one, you know, the critics, the awards, all of that, right? So, and especially in India, like for for years, kind of Indian political, intellectual, social, and media elites have often have criticized mainstream Hindi cinema as an intellectually vacuous, aesthetically deficient, and culturally inauthentic, inauthentic form. And for decades, the mainstream press, government documents, and social elites frequently criticized or dismissed popular Hindi films, right, as an escape for the masses. And for those of you younger, you may think, like, really? Was that ever time? Yes, it was like that. I mean, because now it seems like, anyway. But when something is really popular and widely appealing, it is often commonly characterized in the press, whether it's in India or in the US, and often by media producers themselves as artistic compromise dumbing down, selling out, or catering to the lowest common denominator. Right? We, we still come across that, those, types of, those types of statements. So this illustrates how producing media for a market is often suffused, right? shot through with sentiments of disdain. Since commercial success is really difficult to attain, 
and when attained, often leads to kind of diminished prestige. For example, the biggest box office successes tend not to win Oscars over there or national awards here. Uh, producers need to create kind of alternate regimes of value as a way to manage their own status and social positions within their field. So the sentiments of disdain and practices of distinction aren't only necessary for the creation of these kind of alternate regimes of value, but they also crucially structure the very terrain of commercial media production. So that's one kind of example of what I mean about like let's complicate our understanding of commercial media production. Now if we think of media industries as being made up of three-dimensional, complicated people who all have their own particular opinions, agendas, motivations, identities, etc., then we need to be wary of reproducing industry discourses about success and other assessments of popularity. As I mean I feel as scholars, and I also when I'm talking to my students, I'm always saying we need to be cautious with how we deal with the barrage of statistics and kind of all these aggregate figures that are generated by media industries. Numbers shouldn't be taken as objective realities, but really as hypotheses, right? Put forward to make certain assertions or claims about our social world. So for instance, in the Hindi film industry, the simple but important question, is it a hit or a flop, commonly understood as an audience verdict, is a highly subjective and interpretive determination dependent upon whether one is the producer, distributor, or star of the film. The dominant metric for categorizing commercial outcome in the Hindi film industry is really actually, be, like if you look at the trade, is trade press, is really based upon whether or not distributors make a profit and how much of it, how much of it they make. For example, a film is classified as a hit when the distributor earns two or three times his cost. So from the point of view of the trade, whether a Hindi film is a hit or a flop is actually connected to the distributor and not the theatrical audience. It's the distributor's pricing decisions rather than the number of tickets sold that determines whether a film is classified as a box office success or failure. And that's because of the way, just to give you a sense, like it's because of the, the kind of the particular structure of the industry so that the dominant distribution arrangement here that's known as the minimum guarantee system the distributor's profit is a fact that could be independent of how many people actually saw a film. For a distributor could have paid a really high price for the rights of a film and not earned as high a profit as anticipated. So the amount of profit is actually not, is not congruent necessarily with the size of the viewing audience. That's also because our ticket prices here are completely dynamic, right? You can, you can, two of us can see the same movie and depending where we saw it, when we saw it, what day we saw it, where we sat, the prices are going to be different. So this auction system for allocating distributors to films produces what's known in economic theory as a winner's curse. So the distributor who wins the rights has the highest chance of having overestimated what a film will gross, therefore having the highest chance for a flop. So the categories of, categories of hit and flop are thus generated when distributors' expectations are disrupted. All right, so high expectations can yield a flop and low expectations can yield a hit. So hits and flops are not absolute categories, but relative ones based upon industry expectations, and that's most concretely manifest in the prices distributors pay for film rights. And also in terms of like when you think about occupancies in say the theater, it really depends on whose film it is. If it's a highly anticipated, like, you know, one of the cons, if it's not going at like 90 to 100% occupancy, it's going to be considered a flop. If it's like a newcomer and it's going at 60% occupancy, that's going to be considered a hit. So it really has nothing to do with actually how many bums are in the seats, right? Um, so all the, the buyers of films, distributors kind of occupy the structural positions of consumers within the filmmaking process. They're rarely ever mentioned or implicated in the kind of wide-ranging discussions about the commercial, make, the commercial outcome of a film that's carried out in the film industry, print, and broadcast media, or among viewers. Instead, Hindi filmmakers discuss box office performance in terms of audience composition, tastes, and desires. Right? Hits and flops are interpreted and represented by the news media and the film industry as kind of windows right, into us, into our souls, like, you know, rather than, like, you know, indices of audience subjectivities, rather than a distributor's commercial predictions, right? So, uh, so box office figures are often kind of operating like the Sensex or the Dow Jones. Now, by highlighting the distributor's role in order to question the way box office outcome is interpreted as giving us a sense of the pulse of the audience and the signs of the times, 
My intention is not to imply that a different mechanism to measure commercial outcome would somehow yield truer insights or more accurate knowledge about film audiences. I'm not saying that at all. Because media scholars have long pointed out that audiences for large-scale culture industries, such as television, are literally unknowable. I would argue that the same conclusions could be applied to film audiences as well, and, and <coughs> including like those when we actually go to the theater. Because even if aggregate tickets sold or gross box office receipts are the criteria for categorizing commercial outcome, all they quantify is the act of purchasing a ticket, which at the most measures awareness and interest in a film, not the more complex processes of reception. Box office data doesn't yield information about viewers' intentions, perceptions, experiences, likes, or dislikes. In fact, displeasure with the film once it has been viewed in a theater, can never really be quantified because the action of purchasing a ticket gets registered and interpreted as audience approval. Once you've bought that ticket, it's like, yeah, okay, that means they liked it, right? So while box office outcome at best can be understood as an index of a commercial transaction, media producers frequently interpret it as this expression of social identity, subjectivity, and kind of like emotion or kind of our emotional state. As one young director many years ago asserted during our interview about audiences and box office outcome, this is a direct quote, they constantly reject what they don't want till they accept that one film, and the filmmaker understands, oh, so this is what they want, end quote. Oh yeah, and, and, that's, within that, and that's why every Hindi film that becomes a hit is a pointer in the right direction that tells you, oh, this is what they want, this is what they're feeling right now, end quote. So industry categories, however, should not be our analytical categories. Instead, we should ask, what stories are media industries trying to tell, or what claims are media producers making through their use of quantitative data? Otherwise, we fall into the trap of replicating the discourses of the very industries that we're trying to analyze. So one this one challenge that we face as scholars is not to jump too quickly to extrapolate from media consumption to people's like, this is what people are like, or people's psychologies, or people's like identities, or vice versa. As scholars, we must be wary of simple conflations of consumption with subjectivity, or of trafficking in theories of re revealed preferences, which is another economic theory, whereby the act of watching a particular film or television show is kind of understood or registered as offering insight about a person's identity, attachments, or sense of self. Furthermore, how do we theorize about people's very complex relationship to visual media that doesn't replicate or mirror what media producers are asserting? Can we ever really know unequivocally, without a doubt, why a particular film flops or becomes a blockbuster? Can I put that up there? So unlike, so kind of that leads me to my last point. So unlike other spheres of contemporary life, which are marked by the dominance of these numer numbering logics from economic indicators, human development indices, standardized test scores, sports statistics, right? We're kind of awash with numbers all around us. Mainstream media production is actually significantly characterized by speculative logics. At one level, such an assertion seems counterintuitive because our contemporary media landscape appears awash with numbers from box office grosses to TRPs to the amounts of clicks, likes, tweets on social media. However, as a consequence of the fundamental inability to directly observe and know their audiences, media industries worldwide are essentially speculative in nature. Making films or televisions, or, or television, or any other form of electronic visual media, audiovisual media for large numbers of people, involves a tremendous amount of conjecture, imagining, projecting, and hypothesizing about taste, pleasure, displeasure, desire, and demand, and also it involves a lot of decision making in the face of uncertain outcomes. Media production is also speculative in this other sense of the term, a high risk venture that holds a promise of tremendous financial gain. So mainstream, box office oriented filmmaking is an enterprise characterized by uncertainty. And most apparent in the vocabulary that's part of kind of common lingo, sleeper hit, box office dud, or in, or in pronouncements such as nobody knows anything, which is a popular saying in Hollywood. In India, the unpredictability encompasses both production, films may be aborted midway or never distributed, and consumption, specifically the whims of audience response as kind of gauged by box office outcome. So mainstream feature filmmaking is thus a prime instance of what anthropologist Anna Singh has termed the program of spectacular accumulation, which happens, quote, 
when investors speculate on intangibles, such as stardom, um, oh sorry, which happens, quote, when investors speculate on a product that may or may not exist, end quote. So in the case of feature filmmaking, investors speculate on intangibles such as stardom, narrative concept, or plot, and nearly all of the money to produce a film has to be spent before its commercial value can be determined. Um, Singh discusses how certain sectors of contemporary capitalist economies like software development, mining, biotechnology, real estate, they all attract investment on the promise and potential of success, which she calls the conjuring of economic performance rather than concrete outcomes. And so she talks about those industries, but I would say similarly, filmmaking attracts investment on the appearance of success. So in terms of the Hindi film industry, the appearance of success is critically entangled with the principles of uncertainty and ambiguity. So now in economic theory, ambiguity refers to missing information that could be known, while uncertainty refers to the absence of information at the time of decision making, because the future is yet to have, have been have to be created. So while there are many commercial contexts, fashion, consumer goods, finance, in which demand is uncertain, most industries and analysts are able to measure approximate outcomes, such as sales figures or a volume of business, as a way to de of determining the track record of a company or the economic health of an industry. So even if consumption uh, patterns can't be predicted, they can be measured in most instances because accurate data is available. In the case of the Hindi film industry, however, both uncertainty and ambiguity are hallmarks of its production culture. Uncertainty is most apparent by the fact that when filmmakers embark on their productions, they really can't predict their commercial outcome at the box office until a film releases. There's no way of knowing or gauging its success, right? The ambiguity in the film industry encompasses the difficulty of tracking revenues, as well as the absence of consistent benchmarks for measuring a film's performance. So the problem of data collection in the Hindi film industry is one that's been bemoaned for decades. When I began my fieldwork in 1996, I encountered a great deal of criticism as well as resignation about the lack of reliable empirical knowledge regarding a film's fate at the box office. And much really hasn't changed over these 22 years. So for example, during fieldwork in Bombay in 2014, I met one of the screenwriters for a Hindi film that was widely being advertised in the newspapers as having grossed 300 crores. He commented bluntly to me, says, yeah, that, that, that advertisement is really more aspirational than it is <laughs> truthful. And just today, this morning, I actually had an interview with um, the senior operations manager of Warner Brothers India, and I asked her about, like, she's like, we're very data-driven. I was like, well, how do you do it? She's like, well, it's still the end guesstimates. So they're dealing, so it's all guesstimates, okay? So the absence of verifiable data is connected to the undercapitalized nature of the Hindi film industry prior to the early 2000s, the fragmented relationship between production, distribution, and exhibition, and the high rates of entertainment tax borne by exhibitors. So much of the financial capital for filmmaking was connected to the vast unofficial or black economy, that this is not new, this is not like news to all of you here, which some scholars estimated was nearly half the size of the official economy. So with such sources of finance, the majority of transactions and business dealings in the film industry were um, made in cash, with highly secretive accounting practices and mostly oral contracts. So these conditions resulted in a strong impulse to conceal information in which agents located at different points in the circulation of a film had incentives to misrepresent the amount of revenue a film had earned. So now this ambiguity over commercial, even if now you can see there's a little bit more transparency, but again, like not that much, so everyone I've spoken to even recently say that. But this ambiguity over commercial outcome more importantly creates the possibility that a film is actually more successful than represented in the trade or general press and enables producers or directors to call into question the verdict of poor commercial performance. Right, so the lack of consistent criteria for determining box office hits and flops also allows for a great deal of interpretation or spin on the part of producers, directors, or stars. Right? I mean, there's always these parties that you read about, right? In the Bombay Times, it's like, you know, celebrating, like, they, the film just released, and they're just, like, they keep having parties celebrating the success, regardless of actually what the collections were. Um, so in the contemporary landscape of Hindi film production, where, uh, where production distribution and exhibition companies raise capital through the stock market, there's an even greater incentive to appear successful, as this altered financing landscape rewards companies that appear profitable and growth-oriented. So while journalists, industry professionals,
professionals and management consultants posit the failure to collect data or measure box office outcome as an impediment to the rational functioning of the Hindi film industry, I discovered that this very inability is actually integral to its functioning. So not being able to measure outcome rather than like curtailing or debilitating commercial activity is actually generative and productive of it, fostering certain contracts, business practices, performative displays like those parties and you know, what have you, and discursive mechanisms that attract new capital and prolong industry careers. In other words, the Hindi film industry benefits from poor information about commercial outcome. So over the years, I've realized that in the Hindi film industry, numbers operate less as a transparent kind of objective reality and really more as like tactics or strategies staked out in a field. And the ambiguity about box office outcomes leads the film industry to speculate not only about the future, but also about its past. By speculating about past box office performance, the film industry is able to project a future that is always full of promise. Try reading any of those KPMG Fiki reports. Every it's a constant, like amazing, you know, future is ahead. So not knowing for anything for so not knowing anything for sure is an essential characteristic of large-scale media industries like Bollywood and even Hollywood, and is critical to their continued existence. So while Hollywood obsessively measures box office returns and collects reams of data about audiences, the ability to measure outcomes or even knowledge or interest about a film doesn't translate into an ability to predict its commercial outcome. So an article um, a few years ago entitled How Does the Film Industry Actually Make Money that appeared in the New York Times discussed the core uncertainty that besets Hollywood and asserted, quote, unlike other decades old industries, Hollywood not only has a hard time forecasting, but it also has difficulty analyzing past results. The business is filled with analysts who claim to have predictive powers, but the fact that a vast majority of films fail to break even proves that nobody knows anything for sure. End quote. So in this instance, even with precise data about commercial outcome, Hollywood is still beset with ambiguity or a lack of information about audience tastes, likes, and dislikes. So while film industries try to control for uncertainty in a variety of ways, I contend that ambiguity, whether it's about audience behavior or commercial outcome, helps to attract a new capital, talent, and ideas. After all, many films continue to remain every year in India and the US despite the reportedly high rates of failure. The inability to predict or measure outcome combined with periodical spectacles of tremendous commercial success enable filmmakers to kind of keep betting on and continuing to produce films. So perhaps these are the most palpable dreams that are generated within the quote dream factories, whether they be Bollywood, Hollywood, or some other wood. Okay. So I'd just like to conclude by making a case for the importance of the unknowable. This may sound strange coming from an academic. Our work, after all, is to produce knowledge. However, I feel in this era of narrow casting, big data, targeted marketing, and algorithms that try to predict our tastes and preferences online, the space for complexity, contradiction, and incommensurability seems to be shrinking as media producers work hard to pigeonhole everyone into neat demographic categories. However, the unexpected hit or the, accidental, or the accidental discovery is what sustains and enriches both media and scholarly production alike. Contingency, uncertainty, ambiguity, all fuel creativity. How would we have interesting or innovative media if producers knew exactly what audiences or consumers wanted? Half the time, we don't know what we want until we see it. Right? Similarly, the scholar of the enterprise is predicated on the idea that knowledge is partial and incomplete. Why would we embark on an inquiry if we already knew the answers to our questions? So it is that commitment to submitting to the possibility of being surprised that will enable us to keep asking new questions and developing new research agendas. <laughs>